When the head of Columbia Pictures, Harry Cohn, helped launch Kim Novak's career by landing her a role in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, she seemed to be everything he'd hoped she'd be. She appeared poised to be the next big blonde bombshell to take the world by storm. But in 1957, she fell madly in love with Sammy Davis Jr., who used his soaring popularity to issue a blow to the age-old race barrier that had segregated the entertainment industry. While these two stars' forbidden love was a momentous breakthrough and step in the right direction for societal advancement, a whirlwind of scandal would ultimately bring about its end. There was an incredible amount of backlash against their relationship, so much so that it's even been alleged that Cohn ordered a mob hit against Davis, which forced him to marry black singer Lorray White. Join Facts First as we take an in-depth look at the scandal-ridden, polarizing, and sensational love affair between Kim Novak and Sammy Davis Jr. Kim Novak was Harry Cohn's pet. Kim Novak was essentially Harry Cohn's way of getting his revenge on Rita Hayworth, but Sammy Davis Jr. was Novak's way of getting her revenge on the feared and reviled Harry Cohn. It all began in 1957 at Chez Paris, one of Chicago's most famed nightclubs. Davis Jr., who was known as the greatest entertainer in the world, was performing on stage with a cigarette in hand. He looked like something straight out of the movies. And as the spotlight shined on him, he started singing a song to Kim Novak, who was sitting at a table enjoying a cocktail, fresh off the set of Hitchcock's Vertigo. That evening would prove to be the first and last time Sammy Davis Jr. and Kim Novak would be seen together in public. At the center of their scandalous love affair was one of Tinseltown's most notorious and powerful figures, Harry Cohn. It's been said that Cohn put more people six feet under than all the other moguls and magnets of his era combined. He was the head of Columbia Pictures, and he ran the studio with an iron fist, almost as if it were a family business. And in truth it was, seeing as how he managed to clinch control of the studio out of the hands of his brother Jack. Cohn had transformed Columbia from a second-rate B-film studio, headquartered along Hollywood's infamous Poverty Row, into one of the most prominent players in showbiz. Cohn desired to be feared. He wanted the reputation of being one of the most brutal and ruthless media moguls in Hollywood. His employees were terrified of him. He kept a photograph of one of his biggest heroes, fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, displayed proudly on his enormous desk and decorated his office like the Italian tyrants. James Bacon, a reporter from Chicago, was assigned to cover Hollywood for the AP in 1948, and he had previously covered Al Capone. But after observing Cohn, he found him to be far meaner than any mob boss. He'd keep close tabs on all of his employees and writers. He'd fire a half a dozen people at a time without batting an eye. And for added impact, he'd do it on Christmas Eve. Cohn made his fair share of enemies in Hollywood, but he liked it that way. To him, it was far better to be hated than loved, as it proved he was powerful and power was all he cared about. Director George Sidney, who had made several films with Novak at Columbia, had become one of Cohn's closest allies. While people used to speculate he would someday take Cohn's job, Sidney told reporters no one could ever beat Harry because he was far too smart to be superseded like that. Cohn was extremely proud of creating Rita Hayworth. While he took full credit for turning her into a star that she became, he was also fairly obsessed with her. Even though she was Columbia's big sex pot during that era, she had the habit of getting married. Her first husband, Edward Judson, a 40-year-old car salesman, was said to be controlling and abusive, while she called her second husband, Orson Welles, the great love of her life. After their marriage fell apart, Hayworth went on to marry the heir apparent to the Ismaili Muslim throne, Ali Khan, only for that marriage to eventually break down as well. After Khan, Hayworth married Dick Hames, a noted singer. While married to Khan, a notorious philanderer and playboy, Hayworth was forbidden by her controlling husband to appear in pictures for more than two years. This drew the ire of Cohn and alienated her fans. After returning to Hollywood in 1951, Harry Cohn wanted Rita to appear in one of his pet project films, an epic biblical drama called Joseph and His Brethren. But when Hames, her husband at the time, waltzed into his office and demanded he be cast as Joseph, Cohn threatened to have the Argentinian native deported. To get back at Hayworth, Cohn, who was still reeling from letting Marilyn Monroe slip out of his clutches after being initially less than impressed by her beauty, decided he would make the next girl who stumbled into his office the next big Columbia starlet. He wanted someone who wouldn't give him any trouble. That next girl who walked in was Marilyn Novak, a 20-year-old, busty, aspiring star from Chicago with next to no acting experience but with looks to kill. Since there was already a blonde bombshell going by Marilyn, the first thing they had to do was change her name. 
After toying around with the name Kit Marlowe, they eventually settled on Kim Novak. The studio then pressured her into dropping 15 pounds to contour her figure. They then dyed her hair several different shades of blonde, brought in house designer Jean-Louis to remake her wardrobe, and installed her at the Studio Club, a dormitory for young starlets that imposed a curfew and kept them under strict surveillance. Here, no men were allowed, which meant Cohn could keep his brand new prized possession under his complete control. But after starring in films such as Pushover and Five Against the House, she had firmly established herself as a serious player in show business. She went on to star in films like The Eddie Dutchin Story, Gene Eagles, and Pat Joey later in 1957. With increased fame, Novak was able to weasel her way out of Cohn's complete control by not only leaving the studio club, but also by publicly airing out her salary complaints with the studio. By the time she starred in 1958's Vertigo, she had seized back a great deal of control over her image, leaving Cohn livid. After Sammy Davis Jr. met Novak at that nightclub, a gossip ran that indicated the two had a budding relationship. This made Cohn furious. Davis read the article and called up Novak to apologize for putting her in such a compromising situation. But Novak replied by saying the studio didn't own her and instead invited him over for spaghetti and meatballs. Soon enough, the two were dating. Kim Novak's Relationship with Sammy Davis Jr. In the late 50s, interracial marriages and relationships were rare and often required people to pay a heavy societal price. For Sammy Davis Jr., this price was far more than he anticipated. Turning a blind eye to the racial divide, Kim Novak and Sammy got together in 1957. But as much as they tried to keep their blissful romance alive, Harry Cohn was determined to destroy it. The two strived to keep their relationship away from Cohn and his media associates. They would enjoy intimate dinner dates together in their respective homes and exchange secretive messages, but that wasn't enough. Cohn quickly learned of their secret love affair while attending a memorial dinner in the Big Apple. In fact, he was so infuriated by it, he had a mild heart attack. The couple kept their relationship alive as an open secret for several months. In the meantime, they endured scathing remarks and jabs from their peers, associates, and the press. Eventually, rumors of their upcoming wedding, which was in the works, hit the media after a clerk filing applications for marriage licenses leaked the news. Davis was then allegedly threatened out of the relationship with Novak by a band of mobsters who were affiliated with Mickey Cohen, an infamous West Coast gangster. Davis learned of a hit against him when the thugs approached his father and notified him they had received a contract to hurt him. It was later revealed by Arthur Silber, one of Davis's assistants, that Cohn had ordered that hit. Specifically, they'd been ordered to break his legs and blind his second eye. The other had already been previously injured in a car accident prior. The orders were to hurt him but not kill him. Cohen offered Davis an ultimatum. If he married a woman of color in two days, the hit would be called off. Davis proceeded to take the lifeline and subsequently married dancer Lorray White, whom he dated previously. During the marriage ceremony, Davis reportedly drank excessively to cope with his emotions. While en route to the wedding suite after they exchanged vows, Davis turned on his new wife and attempted to strangle her. Fortunately, his assistant, Silber, stepped in and stopped him. Hours later, Silber saved Davis's life after wrestling a gun out of his hands while he was trying to shoot himself. Davis and Lorray's marriage was doomed from the start. Not only did they never live with each other, but after a year, they divorced. After his marriage to Lorray, Davis and Novak's love affair apparently ended. They remained good friends, but Cohn had ordered her to avoid him at all costs. In 1960, a year after divorcing his first wife, Davis married Swedish actress Mae Britt, who was also white. Even though their marriage likewise generated racially related scandal, unlike his previous union, it didn't result in any violence. The two ended up having a daughter together, Tracy Davis, and adopted two sons before they divorced in 1968. Now it's time to hear from you. What's the most surprising part of this story to you? Let us know in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.